friends, and I invite you now to join me as we pray together. Oh God, we thank you for the gift of this day. We thank you for the gift of this place and all that it means to us and so many more. And Lord, we pray that now you would settle your spirit among us, within us, that you would quiet our hearts and our minds and open us to receive the word that you have for us today. God, I pray that the words of my mouth would not be my own, but that they would be your words for your church. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. So I'm sure that um, you've caught on that, that we had something going on around here this week. Um, Vacation Bible Camp, we had a wonderful time together. We hosted about 70 children here throughout the week, almost as many volunteers, which is a wonderful thing to have. And the curriculum for Vacation Bible Camp is typically five days long, but we only met here for four days. And so I thought it would be fun today to do the last day during church. Um, so that's what we're doing. And so Pastor John and Mari, when they did the skit a few minutes ago, they introduced the idea. Um, and Mari also shared the Bible point and the new Bible buddy for today. That's what all these fun little characters are on the floor. Those are called Bible buddies. And, and the kids this week spent their week learning what it means to shine Jesus' light in different situations in life. And so the four that we'd already talked about before today were when life feels dark, when good things happen, when people are sad, and when people need help. And then today is when people don't get along, to shine Jesus' light in those times. So I know you're all really excited about talking about when people don't get along, right? Yeah, so in case that makes anybody tense, just a little bit, let's do something to lighten the mood, maybe illustrate the point a little bit. And so I thought we'd start by considering some topics that might be polarizing, or maybe debatable is a, a, better, a better word. And so I thought about using which season is better, summer or winter. But in light of recent temperatures, let's just not. Let's just, let's just not, not go there. Or we could do which football team is the best. If you know me, you know which one I'm going to say first, Texas Tech, or SMU. not SMU, <laughs> UT, or OU, okay, let's not do that either, let's stay away from that. So this is the one I settled on. Which is the better pet, a cat or a dog? Okay, hang on. So if you're a cat person, raise your hand. If you're a dog person, raise your hand. Okay, if you're neither, I want to include you too. Raise your hand. <laughs> so, we could fight about that, right? Like cats and dogs. Um, we could focus on our differences, we could argue about those things, or we could choose to find things that we have in common. And I bet that most of us can agree, regardless of what animal we're talking about, if we're talking about pets that we like, we like them because they're cute, right? or we like them because they're fun, or we like to play with them, or maybe we just like things that are soft and furry. I don't know. But, but see what it changes then when we shift our perspective and we focus on the things that are the same. And that's what it means to look for ways to get along with other people in our lives. So I want to look at the story of Jesus and Zacchaeus, a familiar story to many of us. And so if you have your Bible with you, if you have an app on a device, feel free to follow along there or it will be on the screens. I'll be reading from Luke chapter 19 verses 1 through 10. Listen and receive God's word for us today. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through town. A man there named Zacchaeus, a ruler among tax collectors, was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he couldn't because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed up a sycamore tree so he could see Jesus, who was about to pass that way. When Jesus came to that spot, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down at once. I must stay in your home today. So Zacchaeus came down at once, happy to welcome Jesus. Everyone who saw this grumbled, saying, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, look, Lord, I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone, I repay them four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this household, because he too is a son of Abraham. The human one came to seek 
and save the lost. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we find this story near the end of Luke's gospel. And right after this story happens, Jesus actually arrives in Jerusalem for what we know will be the last week of his earthly life. But right before this story, he has healed a blind beggar. And so when we look at this encounter with Zacchaeus and then we couple that together with the healing, it seems to convey one last time why Jesus came. He came to bring healing and he came to bring new life. And so Jesus is entering Jericho. Now Jericho was a large center for taxation and so it was a place of great wealth at that time. And it says that Jesus was passing through, but we know that's not really true because Jesus never just passed through, right? He always had to stop and get involved in what was going on. And he likely had an entourage that was following him because they knew that he was on his way to Jerusalem. And so Zacchaeus is there and he's a chief tax collector. What that means is he worked for the Romans. He was definitely seen as a traitor among the Jews. And and know this, that they would have been horrified horrified to think that he would be remembered with a song 2,000 years later. They would not have liked that. He was hated. He was despised, especially because he likely gained extra money from those who worked underneath him as the chief tax collector, and so he was very rich, and the text tells us that. But he wanted to see Jesus. Now, we don't know why. He was likely an outcast. He was probably lonely. Maybe he had heard of Jesus before, this Jesus who welcomed people like him, people like tax collectors. But he couldn't see. And as the song tells us, it's because he was a wee little man, right? We know the song. The crowd prevented him from seeing, but he was determined. And so he runs and he climbs up in this tree. Now, both of those actions would have been very undignified. Very undignified. So imagine, get a mental picture of a grown man running and jumping up in a tree all while wearing a robe-like garment, which is probably what he was wearing. And so Jesus reaches this place where Zacchaeus is, and he stops, and he looks up at him. And the thing I love about this part of the story is the, the familiarity here, because Jesus calls him by name, And he says, come down, because guess what? I'm coming to your house right now. He sees Zacchaeus' interest, and he also looks at him, and he sees straight through any of the layers of greed or anything else that might be there. And so Zacchaeus immediately comes down and gladly welcomes Jesus into his home. But in verse 7, I think this is the part of the story we often skip over, the part about the crowd. The crowd was offended. They were appalled that Jesus once again has gone to spend time in the home of a quote quote, sinner. Because all they can see is their predetermined judgment toward him. Zacchaeus was very much looked down upon, both literally because of his stature, but also figuratively because of his vocation, what he did for a living. And so because of what were likely dishonest business practices that he kept, He was excluded from the community of God's people. And so Zacchaeus immediately tells Jesus, I'm going to make it right. I'm going to make amends. I'm going to give half of what I own, half of my possessions to the poor, and I'm going to repay the people that I've wronged by four times what I took from them. Now what's interesting about this verse is all of it is in the present tense, meaning he's going to do it now. Not sometime later in the future, he's going to do it now. And Jesus doesn't ask him to do those things. Jesus doesn't tell him what to do. Zacchaeus is simply eager to do what's right. And so what's happening is he's showing the change and the transformation that Jesus has made in his life. That is how Zacchaeus shines Jesus's light. Verses 9 and 10, Jesus ends with two really profound statements. The first thing he said is, today, Today, salvation has come to this house. 
a few important things about that. That means that salvation is a present reality. It's not something that only happens in the future when we die. Salvation is a quality of life that God enables in us now. And it's not because of, of the money that, that, he, that he gave to other people, the possessions he gave to other people, but that action is evidence of a changed heart. He's been set free to experience the life that God intends for him. And so Jesus brings honor to Zacchaeus' home. That's what he does. And he restores him to the community of God's people. The second thing Jesus says is, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Now, the word lost here means in the wrong place. And so what it means is Jesus is helping him find his way back to a place that he belongs in the family of God. Zacchaeus was looking for Jesus, there's no doubt about that, but really Jesus was already seeking him. And when he finds him, he just spends time with him. He just spends time with him in relationship. And so I'll admit that it's been a few months ago actually since I, I went to the children's team and I asked them, I said, I'd love to see the, the curriculum you're using. Uh, knowing that they were only going to do four days, and I thought, you know, I'll, I'll look at what the fifth day is, and, and we'll, we'll think about doing that in worship. Um, and so I saw the theme about not getting along with people, and I thought, okay, you know, yeah, everybody will be thrilled. We'll, we'll talk about not getting along with people. And then I saw the Bible story that they had picked in the curriculum of Zacchaeus, and I was like, huh? I mean, this is a story a lot of us have known from when we were kids, Right? We grew up hearing the story of Zacchaeus and singing the song, and, and a lot of things come to mind when I think of the story, but conflict is not one of them. And so I've wrestled with this a lot this week especially, and, and some things really begin to emerge. God has a way of doing that. Some things have begun to emerge in a new way for me. Because, you know, the reality is that sometimes people just don't get along. That is part of our life, that we, we disagree with people, we find ourselves going in different directions than other people. Maybe we feel caught in between two people or two groups that are at odds with one another. Maybe we're the one that's stirring the pot a little bit, so to speak. Maybe we're the ones pointing fingers at someone else. Maybe we're the ones like Zacchaeus who feel ostracized by a person or by a group of people. Regardless, conflict pulls us apart in ways that are destructive. And God calls us to a better way. God calls us to a way of unity and compassion and kindness and grace. Because God wants us to be bridge builders. God wants us to be peacemakers and agents of restoration for the world. And so the story of Zacchaeus illustrates some attitudes and behaviors that we can adopt in order to really shine Jesus' light in times of conflict. In 2019, not that long ago, there was a poll done by the Barna Group, and they were trying to determine the perception of Christians among adults in the United States. And so they polled a large group of, of adults, some that identify as Christians and some that identify as non-Christians, and they gave them a list of about 20 words. And they said, when you look at these words, tell us if you think that word would describe a Christian in your opinion. And so one of those words was caring. How caring would you say Christians are? To one another, but also to people who might not be in the church. About 40%, not great. Not great. 40% of, of practicing Christians said, yes, we agree with that. Less than 10% of non-Christians could say that they felt like Christian people were caring. And I don't think that's a marketing problem. I think that's an empathy problem. Empathy is the ability to understand and to share the feelings of another person. The word empathy actually began as a German word that carries this idea of feeling into. Feeling into. I love that image. And, and isn't that a great way to describe Jesus? And, and the way that he showed us what it looks like to feel into the reality of another person. He did it over and over. 
There's a book called Born for Love, written by a doctor named Bruce Perry, and the whole book is about empathy. And he says this, this is how he would describe empathy. The ability to stand in another's shoes, to feel what it's like there, and to care about making it better if it hurts. When we encounter someone who's been wounded by conflict, when we're tempted to start conflict of some sort because we disagree with someone, empathy is important. Empathy is important. And Jesus saw people with shame. He saw people with distress. He saw people with hunger of of different kinds. And he had compassion. He made it better. And compassion, by the way, is built on the Greek word for guts. Yes. Being moved in your stomach, deep within. Being moved to help. We all know that feeling, right? And I believe Jesus felt these things. I believe that brokenness moved him deeply. And it strikes me that we as Christians and or as the church in some ways, we've at times moved away from having empathy for those who are outside these walls. I read a story this week about an exchange that happened in the classroom of a seminary. There was a professor that was speaking quite harshly about a group that was outside the church. The article did not list the group. I do not know who it was he was referring to. But there was a student in the class that challenged the professor and said, you know, your choice of language is unloving. And the professor's response was this. The most loving thing I can do is to tell people the truth. And the truth is they're wrong. Now, the author of the article said, instead of speaking the truth in love, truth has now become an enemy of love. Because in an effort to defend truth, we build these walls around ourselves. And it's interesting, if you know much about brain chemistry, the brain is not capable of being defensive and empathetic at the same time. Because we have this fight-or-flight function that resides in the amygdala, which is at the base of your brain, and, and what that does is it shuts down the higher functions in a bid for survival. And so the frontal cortex, which is where um, empathy lies, the, the piece of your brain that's critical to, to have empathy, it's just switched off. But what is possible is to be loving and truthful at the same time. Because Jesus was the truth. And Jesus was also empathetic. Now, I'm not suggesting, I am not suggesting that that we compromise our beliefs, our opinions, not suggesting that. What I am suggesting is gracious dialogue with other people. But for dialogue to happen, for us to gain empathy, for us to really look into the eyes of another person, we have to have proximity. And so empathy is found in proximity. We can't understand situations until we are close to them especially those that are outside of our so-called circle of where we live or where we, what we believe about things. Because those who despise Zacchaeus, those, the people that labeled him as a sinner, he was unwelcome there. He was unwelcome in their community, and we don't know the exact nature of his sins. It likely included defrauding people when he was collecting their taxes, if I had to guess. But when, when Jewish people use the label of a sinner... It wasn't simply used just to identify people who did things contrary to the law. It was also a a cultural slur, in a sense. It was a way of saying that somebody was an outsider, and they did not belong to the community of God's holy people, and they were not welcome there. And so even though Zacchaeus was Jewish, his status as a sinner meant that he was effectively cut off from people who were his neighbors. But really, if we think about it, being a sinner does not mean exclusion from the community of Christ. In fact, it's kind of a prerequisite to membership. Because Jesus came for sinners, like Zacchaeus, like me, and like you. This community is not a place of perfection. This is a community of fellowship of forgiven sinners. We are united to God and we are united to each other through grace. And it's easy to be like the crowd, the crowd in the story. It's easy 
It, it's easy to live there, to ostracize someone else because we don't agree with their choices or their lifestyle or their opinion or their beliefs. Or we refrain from friendship or sharing our faith with someone because we don't want to be seen with, quote, those people. And if we haven't directly done these things, we've all been in a place where we've witnessed it in some regard and possibly remain silent. But Jesus spent time with, Jesus loved sinners like me and like you. And so I think before we question somebody's proximity to Jesus, perhaps we need to question our proximity to that person. Because we are called to bear witness to the good news to every person. Not the ones that we deem worthy, not those that are in our social group, not those that are just in our church. Everyone. Everyone. And when Jesus calls out to Zacchaeus, he doesn't immediately judge him. He doesn't tell him, you need to go repent. He invites him into fellowship. Jesus got close to people. That was who he was, and that's what we're called to do. It's not just about proclaiming a message, it's also about listening. It's about learning. And yes, there is a time for honest, loving conversation. Yes, but we do it in love. After we've come close. Because as Christians, we have more reason than anyone to get close, because our faith is founded on that concept. God came near to us. Emmanuel, God with us, not to condemn us, but to save us. And so we have to become people who are moved to compassion, people who have empathy deep inside us, deep inside our gut. And we can't speak the truth in love if we don't love first. And so God invites us to drop all these walls that we create, the walls that we have around our hearts, the walls that we have around ourselves. And the way we do that is with humility. Humility is holding our power, whatever kind of power it is, whether it's financial power, physical power, intellectual power, we hold that power for good of others, not for our personal gain. And then when we apply that concept to our convictions, it doesn't mean that we believe things less. It means that we treat those who hold beliefs contrary to our own with respect and with friendship. We can decline someone else's doctrine, but we can still demonstrate compassion to them. We can disagree, but we can still work to welcome and honor them as fellow members of the human family, of God's family. We can stand up for our beliefs, but, but not allow my claims of truth to justify discrimination or bigotry. There's no name calling. There's no bullying, just friendship. Because we can flex two muscles at once, the muscles of conviction and compassion. And what that means is that we're not narrow-minded, that we only love those whose lives we approve of, or we're only friends with those who agree with us on every single thing. We can respect and we can care for those with whom we profoundly disagree on some things. We can maintain our convictions, but not allow those things to justify our thinking that we're better than someone else. Because though we're different, we find a way to be in relationship with one another. Earlier when Mari was up here with the kids, she told them that the Bible verse for today is Romans 12, 16. It's very short, and it simply says, live in harmony with each other. Humility leads to harmony. When we find the things that we have in common, and to start with, we're all created in the image of God. So there's something right out of the gate every one of us has in common. And sometimes words can be angry. They can be hurtful. Arguments can cause brokenness and feelings of powerlessness. And so we can use our words then to heal and to strengthen. Because when we're kind and when we're encouraging, our words bring hope and happiness. And Jesus' light within us is a powerful thing. And and I want to think about some ways that, that we can shine that light. Our experiences and our perspectives are not the same as everyone else's. And what I've learned in my life is life is a whole lot easier when we just come to terms with that. And so find a way to listen to perspectives that are different from yours. Maybe that means you find a a new source of, of news for one day or a week, or a new podcast to listen to, 
you find, a conver- you find someone who has a story and a background different than you and you have a conversation with that person and you listen to them. You listen to them and learn from them. You think of somebody that you struggle to get along with. We all have them. We all have those people. But remember what Jesus did. He called Zacchaeus by name, not a mean name. He called him by his name. And so pray for that person. Pray about your relationship with them. And if you feel comfortable, reach out to them and have a conversation. When you see somebody who's been wounded by conflict, extend empathy to them. Extend compassion to them. Because friends, there are a lot of people in our world reaching, reaching for the love of God. Like Zacchaeus, desperate for an encounter with Jesus. But the crowd was an impediment for him. They blocked his view. But he was searching for Jesus. He he was so willing to meet Jesus. But what about the tree? We think about the tree, that sycamore tree that lifted Zacchaeus up, that helped him to see Jesus. Now sure, Jesus didn't need the tree to know Zacchaeus was there. But the tree helped Zacchaeus get a glimpse of Jesus. And so let's be like the tree. Let's be like the tree. Let's lift others up so that they can see Jesus. There is no shortage of conflict in our world. But let's choose a better way. Because the good news is that we can rejoice in the presence of the Lord with others as we love, as we care, as we seek to live in harmony with one another. And so let's be people that gladly welcome Jesus. Let's be people that are committed and ready to shine his light. And let's put our confidence and our hope in the promise that he gives us when he says, today, Today, salvation has come to this house. Thanks be to God. Amen.